We're ready to begin the next session. What ails Indian science and what can be done about it? Nobel Prize winner, Dr. Venki Ramakrishnan in conversation with Professor Dr. K. Vijay Raghavan. Venki Ramakrishnan grew up in India before moving to the US in 1971. Following a PhD in physics, he studied biology for two years before he began his studies on the ribosome, the large molecular complex in all cells that translates genetic information into protein. He moved in 1999 to Cambridge, England, and for his role on the atomic structure of the ribosome and its complex with antibiotics, he shared the 2009 Nobel Prize for Chemistry. He is also the current president of the Royal Society and the author of Gene Machine, a candid memoir that describes both the quest for the ribosome structure and the human side of science. Professor K. Vijay Raghavan is the principal scientific advisor to the government of India and the chairperson of Prime Minister's Science, Technology and Innovation Advisory Council. He was secretary, Department of Biotechnology, Government of India from January 2013 to 2018. He's a fellow of the Indian Science Ac Academics, the Royal Society, the, Ac the Academy of Medical Sciences UK, and a foreign associate of the US National Academy of Sciences. He was awarded the Padma Shri by the Government of India in 2013. <coughs> what ails, <coughs> excuse me. What ails Indian science and what can be done about it? I now invite Dr. Venki Ramakrishnan and Professor Vijay Raghavan to the stage. Good morning, everybody, and thank you uh, for having us here. Uh, I should say we're, both of us uh, have some problems in terms of you know, having a discussion on what ails Indian science. Uh, I, because I left at the age of 19, and have really not, not done science in India ever in my life, uh, I've only visited India since about 2002. So you can think of me as somebody who's an affectionate observer of Indian science uh, from abroad. Uh, my friend and colleague Vijay here has his own problem because he's the chief scientific advisor to the government of India, <laughs> which you know, will put a, a limit on what he can possibly say, even though he may secretly agree with me but you know, we'll, we'll see how uh, open it'll be. So I do, so I wanted to start off with just a few uh, thoughts. Uh, one is we often talk about uh, you know, where India is going, where China is going, and so on. And this is a very, um, sh sorry. You, you can see the screen over there. Is yeah, so this is a, a, a very important reminder of uh, where things stand historically. So for all but the last two or 300 years, China and India had the largest GDP in the world. And in fact, even if you calculated GDP per capita, China and India were among the richest countries in the world for all but the last few hundred years. And if you look at this chart, what you see is a sudden decline in the relative strength of China and India around 1700, 1750. And you see that accompanied by a rise in the GDP of Europe, so that by about 1800, Europe had the largest GDP uh, in the world. Now, why was that? It wasn't because the GDP of China or India de decreased, but rather science and the innovation and the industrial revolution made Europe much, much more productive and much wealthier. Now, you can also see that the United States lagged behind Europe by about 100 years and then overtook Europe. The fraction of U the US to the world economy is now declining. You can see at the very right extreme of the curve that uh, the Chinese GDP is rapidly uh, ascending again and there seems to be a, a more modest ascent in the Indian GDP, accompanied by a decline in the relative fraction of Europe and the United States. So it shows you the power of, of science and innovation and technology. And this is the same graph, but shown slightly different, just to show you the relative 
contributions of these different countries uh, to the world economy. And you can see 300 years ago, it was all, almost all India and China, and then became mostly Europe, then mostly America, and now uh, there's a resurgence uh, in Asia. And the important thing is to realize that natural resources are not as important as knowledge and technology, even today. Africa is extremely rich in national, natural resources. So is the Middle East, so is Russia. But these countries are not as rich as Switzerland or Singapore per capita. And it's because Switzerland and Singapore have heavily invested in a knowledge-based economy. Now, apart from wealth, we don't live, I mean, money isn't useful just by itself. But here's another interesting graph. If you looked about, uh, say, 1800 or, or even 1850, life expectancy was, wasn't that different in much of the world, and it had not changed for about 2,000 years. So if you lived at the time of Buddha or Christ, you would have had the same life expectancy as about 1800. But suddenly, with the advent of modern science, modern medicine, the discovery of bacteria, etc., you can see life expectancy uh, gradually climb. In the last 100 years alone, life expectancy has doubled in almost every country, including India. Okay. So today, if you look at spending on research in R&D as a percent of GDP, uh, what you see is, here's a, I, I'm afraid this graph, you know, the, this isn't really showing the full slide because there, 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 there's an axis on the left which shows, you know, what the percentages are. But you can see here what the relative investment are. And you can see that India does very poorly in terms of uh, f fraction of GDP invested in science. And moreover, the trend is in the wrong direction. Virtually every country has increased its investment in GDP, in, in science and technology as a, f as a fraction of GDP. And in India, it's actually gone down slightly between 2005 and 2015. And if you ask, what is the real problem in India? The real problem is that in most countries, private spending on R&D is usually about two to three times public spending. So, um, whereas in India, private spending is actually less than a third of uh, overall spending. So, if you have to really blame one section of India, it should be why aren't corporations in India investing much, much more in R&D uh, than they should be? So, that sort of the, sets the, the, the stage I hope I've convinced you that uh, a, a lot of the growth in the world's uh, economy, our wealth, our health, has been as a result of science and innovation and investment in it. And India's investment in science and technology far lags behind uh, other countries, including China. Um, thank you, Venki. Um, the point about our science investment uh, that needs to grow, both, I should say, in the public sector as well as corporations investing for their own research, is unexceptionable. And we must parse out two components there. Uh, for the first part, how would public investment grow? Where would that extra or the uh, increased investment go to. And for the industry investing, why are they not investing and how should they invest? And the quick answers to both before I come to a more general uh, question about why we need more money in science today. The first part is that over uh, the period since independence, central government investment in science has concentrated on central universities, central institutions, such as the IITs, now more recently other new institutions, 
the All India Institutes, and rather substantially, research laboratories of the CSIR, the Department of Science and Technology, the DRDO, the DAE, and so on and so forth. All of this numerically constitutes about 5% of the student population who have access to these. In other words, 95% of our students who go to state universities don't really get access or do research substantially. There are some notable extensions, uh, uh, exceptions over this period, but we need a dramatically increased investment and an engagement with states to address research in this group. Now for industry, our conversations with industry bodies over the last couple of years, the CII, the FICI, the SO Cham, and so on, have resulted in two uh, kinds of um, developments. One is they all agree that research is needed, investment by them in research is needed, otherwise the carpet will be pulled from under their feet as technology has changed, as it's happening now. But they are averse, they have capital, but they're averse to risking that capital through research. Big corporations elsewhere, for example, Google's investment in R&D is more than the US National Science Foundation's investment. Uh, Indian corporations, some sectors are doing reasonably well, only because others are not. Pharma is better than others slightly, but other areas are not. So the idea which is getting some traction is they increase investment but they partner with laboratory networks such as the CSIR so that that risk is mitigated somewhat. I'd like to end this, my views on this part, we'll come back to Venki, on a more general, deep concern I have about why we need science today, investment in science, and why we need science and technology to be effective. The fundamental uh, perception about science over the last several decades, last couple of centuries really, is about science as the engine, as, as the discoverer of technologies which are useful for people. In doing that, we have forgotten what has happening to the planet as a whole, and that the engines of development, the industrial revolution and so on, have always had an other to feed into. So iron ore and the steam engine allowed the industrial revolution in Britain, but that meant further raw materials needed to come from elsewhere, including the iron ore. And similarly, you know, exploitation of people, of resources, characterized multiple industrial revolutions. Today, as the world's largest democracy, we have a big challenge. We have to be socially inclusive. We don't want to exploit internally for our development. We don't want to exploit externally in terms of, you know, going to continents like Africa and mining rapaciously. How does one develop today in that context? And that context is an important context because that's the context of what we now call the Anthropocene, where humans have transformed the planet into a perilously dangerous situation, and therefore we have to take into account climate change and global warming and the rise of you know, tools such as artificial intelligence while we develop. So this is a really complicated challenge also when we look at investment to see how we can uh, deal with this situation as we invest more. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, you did point to the fact that only about 5% of students benefit from these central institutions, and about 95% study in state universities. I should say I did my undergraduate studies at one of those uh, state universities in Gujarat. And the, there, is, there is a more fundamental problem about increasing investment in science uh, and technology, uh, and that is um, you cannot just simply start increasing the science budget because you need people to absorb it. It's not simply a question of building new buildings and building new labs. You have to train uh, a, a sufficient number of people who can actually use the money efficiently, use it in, a, in an intelligent way and not waste it. Uh, so I think this, if there's a, going to be an increase in science and uh, technology investment, it has to be coupled with an investment in education. And that leads to the point of what do you do about the 95% rather than the 5%. And 
that again leads to another problem. You know, we're sitting here at uh, this very uh, somewhat elite festival. Everybody here speaks English, all the sessions are in English. But I should say, only a few percent of Indians actually know English. We forget them, you know, we're uh, this thin slice and we sort of are in our own echo chamber. Uh, but 90 to 95 percent of Indians don't speak English at all. And, you know, they need education, they need, uh, you know, textbooks, they need good textbooks in vernacular languages, uh, and so on. If you look at a country like Poland or Germany, what you find is that although English is the international language of science, when they're young, they're not learning science in English. They're learning it in Polish or in German or Danish or whatever, okay? And then when they become scientists, you know, they have to learn English in order to be successful internationally. But when you're young, it's much easier to absorb concepts in your own native language. And if that native language is some other uh, language, whatever it is, that's the language in which you should try to absorb concepts. So this is a real challenge uh, for India. How do you train, instead of selecting scientists from 5% of the population, you need to select for talent from 100% of the population. And so how do you do that and, and how do you get to uh, that place? That is, that's a very big challenge. It's a bigger challenge than simply building new buildings and, and buying equipment. Now, this business of encouraging R&D in industry, that is a problem many countries, including Britain, grapple with. Uh, Britain's private R&D is significantly higher than India's, but it still lags behind countries like Germany, for example, or Korea, South Korea. So there are a number of ways you can do this. You can have tax incentives, you can have uh, sometimes direct collaborations between government and R&D, as you said, with CSIR. So th that's another area that uh, you have to uh, grapple with. You also mentioned science as a as a tool for improving people's lives. And of course, this is the reason why governments fund uh, science. I often say the only reason governments fund science, there are only two reasons. One is we're afraid of dying, and the other is we're afraid of our enemies. And so, sci you know, so we, we fund medical and biological research so that we can understand things like cancer and heart disease and so on and live forever. And we, fund, we fund physical and you know, electronic science, et cetera, so we can build better weapons so that we're stronger than our enemies, you know, better aircrafts and so on. And, and so cynically, those are two reasons why you might think governments fund science. But reali the reality is, curiosity-driven science has had a much bigger impact on our lives than any directed science. So if you look at, you know, any device like this iPhone that I have, or any smartphone, uh, there are about a dozen Nobel Prizes that have gone into uh, this iPhone, including, I should say, something that didn't get the Nobel Prize, but the special and general theory of relativity uh, that Einstein had, without which time correction couldn't be accurate enough so that GPS wouldn't work. So it gives you an idea Almost anything you'd think of today as technology had its roots in some fundamental scientific idea that was curiosity driven. Uh, one example is electricity. You know, Faraday was asked by uh, the prime minister of the time, you know, what good is this? And he said, well, one day, sir, you may tax it. You know, he said about electricity. And, <laughs> You know, if you imagine what the worldwide tax on electricity is today, you know, it's probably in the trillions of dollars. So, you know, that just goes to show you that uh, fundamental science can transform society in completely unprecedented and, and unpredictable ways. So we must always set aside a core of our investment for basic science for s several reasons. First, that's where unexpected breakthroughs may come from. The second is, without that basic science, and without a pool of basic scientists, 
you won't even be able to take advantage of discoveries made elsewhere in order to apply them. You need a foundation of basic science even to understand how to exploit discoveries made elsewhere uh, for technology. So those are some thoughts, but I want to now challenge Vijay with another uh, thought, which is I've come to uh, India almost every year since about 2006, and I find that the standard of science in India has improved, say, from the 1970s when I left it. But there is a, sl a difference, and that is I see very few examples of Indian scientists breaking original ground and really being, you know, the leaders in their particular field. Rather, there, there's too much, uh, too many examples of what I call Me Too science. Uh, Me Too used to be a word before it became a word uh, <laughs> recently. Uh, and in science, Me Too science meant, you know, imitative or, or, or sort of second derivative science. And, uh, you know, CNR Rao once told me that, you know, he had done a lot to sort of encourage scientists to come back from abroad and, and try to get them facilities. And he said, many of them come back and they do sort of minor extensions of what they did as a postdoc. And they keep doing that for the rest of their lives. This is a cultural problem and it affects the next generation of scientists because scientists learn from their mentors on how to think about science, you know, how to go about choosing a problem, how to go about working on it, how to, how to know how long to stick to it and when to quit. And if they don't get, you know, if their mentor is simply interested in doing the next experiment, getting the next paper out, then they're not really learning how to do uh, you know, high-level science. Now, Vijay works in one of the top institutions in uh, India, which is, I would say, somewhat something of an exception to the rule. So I want to hear his thoughts on this. Well, um, my serious problem with Venki is that I agree with almost all he says. All he says. Yeah. So, now, the core problem for the expansion of our scientific effort here and for language is, uh, uh, and, uh, and um, you know, in terms of quality, is what he touched upon, which is language. Language is not only important because it makes science inclusive and equalizes opportunity, but fundamentally, for original thinking, you have to be rooted through your language, through cultures, and through society. You cannot learn something which is disconnected with that and be anything but imitative. The median population will be imitative if it tries to do that. There are exceptions, you'll always find exceptions. And you'll find extraordinary people who have overcome barriers and, and, done, and been original, but there would be exceptions. So the language issue for learning needs to be done. But language is a one aspect of it. The other is what I call the salt and pepper mix of Indian society. You have, sorry, uh, you have a salt and pepper mix in Indian society uh, of the elites and the rest of the country. And this disconnect causes a real serious problem in policy making. Our policy making often therefore tends to be again imitative and again decisions being taken which serve a small set and not contend with a more complex, larger sphere, which is very difficult. Now, the problem about imitativeness goes even further beyond that. And this is because of our entire scientific workforce, for all the reasons Venki said, I completely agree with him, is not ambitious. Uh, I asked uh, another Nobel laureate, David Gross, uh, a string theorist who works a lot in India, building in, helping build institutions and in China, and asked him what characterizes the difference between China and India. And leave aside, you know, money, resources, management, and so on and so forth. And he said, very simply, it's ambition. That India, at the individual level, at the institutional level, at mission levels, 
of certain larger kinds needs to be much, much more ambitious, and that requires a collective connect with a, a broader purpose, and that, again, is absent. So these are certainly serious issues. So I want to touch on a topic that's been controversial recently, which is this whole business about culture and science. And what I'd like to say, so, you know, about a year and a half ago, I was asked by the Science Museum in London whether I would serve on an advisory panel for an exhibition called 5,000 Years of Indian Science. And I, I said I'd be delighted to do this. And one reason was that I thought this was a useful corrective to some of the nonsense we've been hearing uh, lately. Uh, now, this nonsense is limited to a very small but vocal uh, minority. It's not representative of Indian scientists. It's certainly probably not even representative of the Indian public. But they are a small vocal minority who have misinterpreted what science is about and sort of read into Indian scriptures various sort of scientific discoveries and so on. And the reality is India has much to be proud of that's actually real rather than mythological. For example, the number system that uh, the entire West uses uh, came out of India. Uh, India was very advanced in metallurgy in many areas of mathematics. Uh, and, you know, so a lot of these discoveries were actually adopted by the West. Now, the West is not ashamed to say that, oh, we took the number system from the Arabs who got it from India. They think that's perfectly fine. And similarly, we should not be embarrassed to say, well, we've learned about Newtonian mechanics and quantum mechanics uh, from the West, we, or, or airplanes. Think, this is what knowledge is about. Knowledge has no boundaries. And if you want India to be a great uh, scientific nation, the idea is not to harp on some, uh, you know, mythological 2,000-year-old, uh, you know, ideas, but to say, we're going to use the whole uh, fount of knowledge that we have today, which is really a product of entire humanity, not of any one country or any one civilization. And so we're going to simply absorb everything we know today, and we're going to build on that. And everybody else is building on it, and we are going to continue uh, to build our part and uh, thus contribute to the advance of human knowledge. I think that's the way to look at it. And I sense that some of these people suffer from some sort of inferiority complex. And this is their, this is their way of sort of boosting themselves. Uh, and, uh, but it's the wrong way to go about it. I think really, if you want to have national pride, then you know, learn as much as you can and, and, and contribute to advancing human knowledge. That's the way to really uh, be proud. Um, again, I think, um, you know, this is um, absolutely uh, on the spot. I would add something to that. Um, I was just yesterday, you know, reading an article written about seven or eight years ago by Rodham Narsama, who is one of our famous uh, scientists. He does fluid mechanics, a fellow of the Royal Society, the U.S. National Academy of Science, a really brilliant person. And he had pretty much in his article on the history of Indian science from ancient times to now, uh, captured the beginning of what you said, but also went on to point out the current situation. And, and there, there's a fundamental issue which comes up in the way we have structured our centers of learning. They have, again, for the reasons we discussed before, been disconnected, have deep expertise, but disconnected with conveying to people at large what science is about, the value of science. Music, for example, Hindustani music or Carnatic music, is appreciated naturally. Science is not appreciated naturally except in the wrong garb of technology or applications by people at large. So unless people at large want science as a quest for knowledge, this disconnect will be amplified. If this disconnect is amplified and you have people who don't have expertise 
trying to you know assert themselves as as being their self esteem or their you know being equals on the table then you have these kinds of statements coming out if the response to that is that you know you must learn better then this amplifies the difference even more of course one must learn better of course what is being said is nonsense but that means that we must have a way by which this salt and pepper combination needs to uh, engage even more that is the principal challenge how does one do that and that requires i think a uh, empathy with a larger subset to have expertise widening in the population as distinct from solid strong criticism of you know statements which are completely egregious right and i think that goes back to the thing we discussed b before which is how do you engage the 95% instead of the just the 5% you know I if you start teaching science in indian in regional languages uh, as well as english and you engage a much bigger fraction of the population in what science is about and the uh, and how science is fundamentally a skeptical discipline and always questions authority, questions facts, uh, demands evidence. Uh, so if we incul inculcate that sort of thinking among uh, the, the, the majority of the population, then the, I think they will you know, naturally be skeptical of, of statements like this. Uh, and moreover, they will, it, it is important to communicate to the broad majority of the Indian public some of the great triumphs of science. You know, this is part of our uh, common heritage as human beings, uh, not necessarily as Indians or uh, Americans or Europeans or whatever, but as human beings, Absolutely. this is part of something yeah. that we have achieved yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, together over several thousand years. We've come to a state of understanding, and it doesn't mean we there's, there's a huge amount that we don't know, but it's, it's an on, ongoing journey. But we need to let people in on the journey and what is happening today. Right. So there's a, you know, this is a very important point. If people have to look at science as something which is part of their lives, then they must do it for something which they sense as you know, either logical or share a purpose. And today's crisis, due to climate change and the other examples I gave you, transcends, like science, national boundaries. And these kinds of crises require people across countries and countries to work together. And there's no escape from that. And therefore, my feeling is just that at times of crises, people came together as humans, uh, working together for some common cause that happens rarely in human history, this is a time where this is absolutely urgent for us to do. Amitav Ghosh, the Indian writer in English who recently got the Gandhi Award, um, a very strong critic of the establishment, talks about climate change as something which is a runaway train. My worry is that if it's a runaway train, then it's time to party, there's nothing one can do. But it's there is a possibility that we can reverse or stop that runaway train, and that comes only by working internationally uh, across uh, together and taking the best of science uh, to do that, uh, both for discovery and for application. How are we doing for time, Vinky? I don't know. Uh, someone going to... Because there's, we, we talked about a third component, about not just about uh, what needs to be done, but how to do it, and maybe we can segue into that. Yeah, so. One thing we we discussed is okay. okay. So we'll ten minutes for questions. So we have ten minutes for questions, right? So so we'll, so we'll we'll wrap it up with uh, some ideas. So I'll, I'll I'll start by telling you an inst about an institution that works, which is where I actually happen to be employed. It is not a very big institution. It has about four hundred scientists. It started with about forty scientists. And when it had 40 scientists, in its first year it won four Nobel Prizes. And it won its 15th and 16th Nobel Prizes in the last two years. And this is the MRC Lab of Molecular Biology in Cambridge. Now why does it work and why has it sustained a very high level of science over now three generations? 
Uh, and the reason is that uh, it does several things. The first is people are forced to ask, why are they doing this? You know, you always ask your colleagues, what's the, po what's the point of this experiment or what's the point of this project of yours? What are you trying to actually achieve? And that forces you to think about what the actual problem is, r not what your next experiment is going to be, etc. You can think of it as if you want to climb Everest, you can't get to Everest in one step. But what you have to do is you have to have a goal of getting up on top of Everest. And then you have to sort of say, well, to get over there, this is the sort of next step that I'm going to have to take. And after that is going to be uh, the next step after that. And pretty soon you've sort of charted a way towards a goal. Now, if you don't have a goal, you'll be wandering around uh, sort of like a drunk in a, in a parking lot. You, 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 know, you won't have a, a direction and you won't actually accomplish anything at the end of your, your career. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is we provide stable funding, but it's also judged very rigorously. So every five years or uh, so, uh, we're judged by a, an international review panel that asks not what we published or how much we published, but ask, is what you're, we're doing sensible and are we making progress, even if it's not publishable? Uh, a third thing is we have complete collegiality between our, uh, us uh, within the Institute. And a fourth thing, which I think is very important, is we don't have large groups. Our group size is typically about five or six. And th what this does is it forces you to pick what the most important problems are. And it, in other words, I don't think anybody has more than one or two good ideas. And if you have a very large group, what you end up doing is giving lots of people your sort of second and third rate ideas. And then you, they take up time and, they ta and they're a distraction away from the things you really want to accomplish. So these are some of the things that work. Now, there isn't a one size fits all method for science. For example, this would not apply to something like the Human Genome Project or the discovery of the Higgs boson. So you have to realize that there are multiple ways of doing science. But some of these principles, the idea that there should be a goal, that the idea there should be high standards, the idea that review bodies should be both competent and rigorous, these are things that need to be, uh, I think, more strictly enforced. You know, um, this is important, and I'll add some aspects to that. There's a challenge in our context about whether you're going to nurture excellence or to develop the spread of foundations which can nurture excellence. Because of our huge size and our population, both are needed, and we conflate you know, one against the other quite often. When we support excellence along the lines of what Venki says, there's a demand for you know, spreading it with lowering standards because you know you have to compromise to start things off. And when you try to demand excellence in those contexts, it doesn't work. This, this dichotomy needs to be cleared in a manner so we can both nurture specific centers of excellence but also allow it spread. So how does one do that? First of all, I'd like to say that you know we shouldn't from this discussion take home that nothing is happening of consequence in Indian science. There's some extraordinary things happening, and let's take you know, the context of Chennai itself. In IIT Madras, over the last decade or so, the entire science and technology on data transmission and analysis has resulted in really great impact in wireless telephony. That's been very valuable. Uh, that's had impact very rapidly in applications in multiple ways. Electric vehicles and batteries uh, and, and cells. Again, IIT Madras has excelled. And IIT Madras has done really well in some other areas, partnering with the RAR Cancer Center in new ways of looking at data and cancer. Uh, this is just one example. But why do I bring this example up? You look next door. You have Anna University. You have the RAR Cancer Center. You have the Central Leather Research Institute. You have the Institute for Math Sciences. And you, know, you have a network of colleges all over Chennai. IIT Madras is not owned by Chennai. And here is a tremendous opportunity. If IIT Madras 
can connect without compromising its independence, its isolation to some extent, which is needed for expertise, and interact with the ecosystem in broadening excellence while nurturing it and am amplifying it inside. Then this hub and spoke system with the similar structures in Bangalore, Hyderabad, Pune, Delhi, um, Kolkata, and so on, can allow the strength and investment of our phenomenal foundations over decades to spread. And that needs to be to spread. But again, it's not the spread of investment alone, which is needed, of more quality laboratories, which are needed, but as Venki says, the culture of doing science in a non-hierarchical uh, hierarchical way, which questions authority. That culture also needs to spread, and that's the principal challenge. That requires the, you know, the development of leadership, and that's never easy. Uh, just putting the plumbing in, but not having the right kind of water supply will be a problem. I just want to, I, I want to quickly talk about this business of excellence. So there, there is a slight misunderstanding. When I say excellence, I don't mean the sort of huge groundbreaking discoveries that, you know, change science and so on. But rather, any science ought to be done in, an, in a way that ensures excellence. In the sense, it should be rigorous, it should have a clear goal. Uh, when you do the experiment, you should be able to tell what you've achieved and what the next steps are and so on. So I think, you know, that sort of excellence ought to be very widely cultivated. It's, it's not about, uh, you know, being at the frontiers of cancer research or, or physics, etc. cetera. So, so I think excellence can be and should be really very widely dispersed. And, you know, we need to define what that excellence is and, 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 and ensure and nurture it. Um, I think maybe we're sort of, we sh should we open the floor to yeah, questions? I mean, the dangerous thing is that we can go on and on, but we should, I think, open the floor to questions. Yeah. yeah. The second row, yeah. What we'll yeah. do is we'll quickly take three questions oh, yes. so that then we can, you know, answer those yeah. uh, together. And decide. Thank, thank you very much for the interesting debate. Mike, I'm Narsi Malu, one of the faculty in biomedical engineering. My question is there are sophisticated instrument facilities at the public funded institutions it is invested. And this should be also open on the time-based manner to other institutions which is also as a IACT approved institutions. Okay, but this should happen. That's what you are telling because network of institution, but that is not happening over the f years. If you visit Pawai, IIT Pawai, there are several investments which are lying and absolute also, the equipments. And these equipments can be thrown open to the other institution in their clusters. Got, got the That's a big investment. Yeah, got the point. Let's take kindly. Let's, yeah, first, uh, second row here. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, you both, my query to Professor Venki is that in your comparative genealogy of growth after 1800, along with development of science and technology in Europe, what also contributed is European colonization of the world. Yes, I So let, let me complete my question. Yeah. Therefore, the challenge is not just investment. Now, along with Newtonian mechanics, what is the challenge for colonialism, not only in terms of practice of science, but epistemology of science? And my query to Dr. Vijay Raghavan no, is, so okay, okay, that's fine. Yeah. For, okay, thank you. So, so I want so, to get to so your question first before we get to yours. After I completely that. disagree with your premise, okay? And the reason is, the reason is, if you look at Europe and you ask which were the richest countries around 1900 in Europe, there were Germany, Switzerland, and Sweden, the three countries which had almost no colonies. If you ask which were the countries in Europe that were the poorest, there were Portugal and Spain, which had the most colonies per capita. So the, the, the wealth of Europe did not come from colonization. Colonization is a separate historical thing which led to exploitation of other countries, but the wealth came from 
exploitation of human knowledge and the industrial revolution. Uh, one, this, uh, this so, question is for Dr. Vijay. Uh, we'll, we'll, sorry, the woman at the back and then you. Yeah, yeah go ahead. We can't hear you. Yeah, sir. So the Department of Atomic Energy has proposed for India-based uh, neutrino observatory in Theni, Potipuram, but there is a huge opposition in the state, you know, citing environmental degradation. So, what would be your piece of science, uh, sorry, advice? So, uh, so is, this is certainly a curiosity-based uh, science, right? So, yeah, curiosity-driven yeah, science. Yeah, so, yeah. what what is your piece of advice? Uh, I'll, so this I'll, is I'll answer the question, but we had a. I'll answer it right after the first question, which we asked, which you haven't yet answered. Which was I've forgotten the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So, so there are lots of efforts on sharing those happening. I think it's good, but I think as importantly as Venki pointed out, while that's critical and important to have access to equipment and share it, the critical point is also to have an ecosystem which shares discussion, debate, and curiosity. That fundamentally is absent. And as a consequence of that, equipment sharing will also become much easier if you amplify that. But, but, I, but I do agree. I think uh, sharing yeah, is a very yeah, good yeah, idea. Dr. Vijay. But, yeah. Sorry. Dr. Sorry. Vijay, I so, have so, a, I have so, a so, question so, for sorry, you. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Well, let me let me finish the neutrino neutrino question. Neutrino question. Yeah. So the neutrino Indian neutrino observatory project is a very old proposal, dating back, if I'm not mistaken, to over a decade ago. It had many points raised from the environment ministry and the local environment bodies which have been addressed. And they've been addressed repeatedly. And right now the situation is that the Ministry of Environment has given its clearance to the project. And the state uh, government uh, environment agencies have to accept that and go forward. That's the technical situation. Please. Dr. Vijay, uh, actually Dr. Venki made a very right point uh, that you know uh, while the resources we are allocating for research and development, they are limited. Uh, at the same time, we need to develop the capacity, uh, this capacity, institutional capacity, uh, to be able to use it properly. I'll give an example. Uh, in one of our university, which is one, uh, like when they were celebrating 150 years of existence, uh, then government of India gave them 100 crores uh, to develop a national institute for nanoscience and technology. And now it is almost 12, 13 years. And we find that because of this lack of administrative capacity, uh, they have not been able to develop this excellence uh, uh, center. So my suggestion to you is that as a policymaker, uh, you need to focus on developing this administrative capacity also in our researchers and academicians. And second point is, uh, when you say that 95% of the students, uh, they are studying in state universities, uh, one problem is the way we are recruiting our faculty in these state universities. We have these wrong incentives of number of papers you publish and then, you know, uh, like how many uh, research scholars you guide and all that. Actually, we have to give the right incentives also for the right development of science and research in our country. So can I address both these points? I, I should say that point is a, it's a worldwide pro recruiting and the criteria for recruiting faculty that's a worldwide problem. And I think, you know, this, there's an ongoing discussion everywhere in the West about what is the cr proper criteria, what, how should we judge papers versus other qualities and so on. That's a very difficult problem, I think. Sir, Namaste, sir. Uh, Why can't our country develop research and development in fundamental sense at basic level, sir? Sorry, 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 sorry. Why can't our country develop research and development in fundamental size at basic level, sir? You know, India is one of the few, perhaps the only post-colonial country which has invested in basic science and in science in general uh, post-independence. Most other countries didn't invest on this scale. So we have indeed invested in fundamental science over decades hugely. My own lab um, has grown because of the government's investment in completely unproductive, useless science, right? And, and this is the government of India which has invested in this. It's curiosity-driven science. So I think India has invested. But the problem is, is, is something more. Is 
are we using that investment? Is that investment sufficient? Are we using it to ask questions which are interesting? Or are we using it to chase specific metrics, the secondary or tertiary derivatives, or not? And that's the challenge. So both investment needs to go up, but also, you know, we should stop uh, this global trend of chasing metrics rather than questions. I'm afraid we have to stop here. We, I've been told to finish up. And uh, and uh, this is, in any case, this is not a problem that's going to be solved even if we spoke for the rest of, you know, the session, the rest of the day. Uh, but I hope it's given you some flavor uh, of the issues involved. They're complex and they'll take time to solve. Thank you very much. Thank you.